Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today, to understanding the truth of the Scriptures of God, to know who God the Father and Jesus Christ are, why it is that Jesus alone can be the sacrifice to forgive our sins. That was because he was creator, Lord God of the Old Testament. But also, many people don't realize that he even prophesied of his own birth. Now, we saw that he had to divest himself, empty himself of his glory, so that he could become a pinpoint of life and to be impregnated in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Let's see a prophecy of this back in Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, not a virgin, shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel means God with us. Now, let's look at another prophecy of this over here in Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now that's quite a prophecy, isn't it? Let's read just the next verse here so we understand what it's telling us of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with righteousness from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now let's go back and analyze verse 6 just a little bit. The names Wonderful, Counselor, and Mighty God are the qualities of God. So this is telling us, combined with Isaiah 7 and verse 14, and we will see Matthew the first chapter and Luke the first chapter, that the one who was God manifested in the flesh, divested himself of his glory, but still had enough of the Spirit so that he was God manifested in the flesh. And this shows what he would be. Now, the question is here, the everlasting Father. A lot of people stumble at that because they, they don't know, well, how can Jesus be a Father? Is this referring to God the Father of the New Testament? What does this mean? Well, it means just this. You read in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, that the church is going to marry Christ. And that's going to take place just before the kingdom of God is established on the earth, when the resurrected saints return with Christ and come to this earth and set up the kingdom of God. Now, today, the Christians through Christ are called the children of the Father, God the Father. But here it's referring to the one who would become Jesus Christ, that he would be an everlasting father. Now, is there any conflict here? No, there is not. Simply this. When the church and Christ marry, the work that they do to bring in other sons and daughters into the kingdom of God, then Jesus will become a father to those just as God the Father is a father to us now. So therefore, he can be called the everlasting father, because does he live forever? Yes. Will he be a father then? Yes, the everlasting father. 
the Prince of Peace, no one else can be peace, and only he is going to sit on the throne of David and bring the kingdom of God here. Now let's come to Matthew, the first chapter. Now, as we're turning there, I want to introduce you to another book that we have called A Harmony of the Gospels in Modern English, The Life of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a book devoted to going through showing the historical and chronological setting of the life of Jesus Christ, going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and putting all the scriptures together in a chronological way to show the historic ministry of Jesus Christ. And you will find that this is a tremendous book and understanding about the life of Jesus Christ. Now let's come to Matthew, the first chapter, and let's see concerning Mary, who was before her marriage to Joseph found to be pregnant of the Holy Spirit. And this was the message that was given to Joseph, saying, take your wife, because what is in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll read another account of this in Luke, the first chapter, in just a minute. Now, the angel, and it was Gabriel, told Joseph this, And she shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all this came to pass, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is, being interpreted, God with us. Yes, God manifested in the flesh. Now let's see how in the Gospel of Luke that it's revealed how Mary became pregnant. How is it that this took place? Now remember, we saw that the one of Elohim who became Jesus Christ was God first, also called the Word, and how he humbled himself and divested himself of his glory and power to become a pinprick of life, to be impregnated in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Now let's understand this. Jesus received his human nature from his mother. And God then became his father at the point of the impregnation in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So let's see that the angel, Gabriel, who apparently is in charge of all the things concerning the coming of Christ, because he revealed the 70-week prophecy also to Daniel. And he also spoke to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who was the messenger to go before Jesus Christ. So you see how all the Bible properly put together agrees with itself. And this is why we need the Old Testament and the New Testament, the whole Bible. We don't throw away part of the Bible because we don't agree with it or eliminate this other part of it, or we ignore this part of it because it doesn't conform with the teachings of the church. No, you have to have the whole Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, and they go together, and when you have it properly put together in the right order, which we have in the Holy Bible in its original order, and there's a special way that you can get it, so visit the home page on Church at Home, and you'll be able to find out how you can receive it. And in the book, The Harmony of the Gospels, as well as in the Bible, we have the flow of events to show us when Jesus was born. And he wasn't born anywhere near Christmas. No way. So the whole fable that Jesus was born on December 25th is a pagan myth, which is a lie. Now, how can you have the truth of God revealed to you by a lie? Hmm? Isn't that a little contradictory? You need to think about that. So what have you believed? And did you know that Jeremiah 10 says, you're not to have a Christmas tree? And yet the whole world has it. 
And the second commandment says, shall not make any image of any likeness of any kind that's on the earth, it's in the heaven above, and the earth beneath. And yet, what do we have? Well, we have Christmas scenes with the manger and a little doll of the Lord Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the three wise men. A myth didn't happen that way. So you see how the world that calls itself Christian is blatantly not Christian. So let's read it here. Verse 26 of Luke 1. Now in the sixth month of her pregnancy, that is her aunt Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, the high priest and father of John the Baptist. And this is a key which then helps understand when Jesus was born. And as you will see in the book, The Harmony of the Gospels, he was undoubtedly born on the day of trumpets, according to the calculated Hebrew calendar. Now, maybe you've never heard of the calculated Hebrew calendar, but I'll tell you one thing, when God does things and he calculates time, it's not according to the calendar that's hanging on your wall. It's according to the calculated Hebrew calendar, which is what he gave to the priesthood so that we would know when the Sabbath was, when the Passover, when the holy days were, and when to keep them. Now, that calendar is different than the Roman calendar, and, and those days have to be coordinated with the Roman calendar today so we know when to keep them. So that's just a little sidebar. Let's continue here. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the lineage of David, and the name of the virgin was Mary. And after coming to her, the angel said, Hail, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Well, this startled Mary. Quite a thing. Verse 29 says, But when she saw him, she was greatly perplexed at his message, wondering what kind of salutation this might be. I guess so. You know, one of the archangels of God coming to Mary. So you know that this was a highly important event. Yea, it was a greatly important event. Yes, it was a universe important event. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you found grace with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. All right. Stop right there. In the Old Testament, when we have the highest Lord, that is a reference to God the Father. But that's not a revelation of God the Father. Jesus has to reveal the Father to everyone that he personally chooses and calls. Now back to this. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his forefather, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob into the ages, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Fulfilling of the prophecy of what? Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. Yes, indeed. Well, Mary knew about the facts of life. She understood how children come about, and yet she was a virgin. She was betrothed to Joseph, not yet married to him. And here comes an angel saying, you're going to have a child. So naturally, here's a question. But Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, since I've not had sexual relations with a man? Now the King James says, had known a man. That's a polite way of saying sexual relations. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest. Now look at here another little sidebar so we can learn from the word of God. The Holy Spirit is called what? the power of the highest, not 
God, not Holy Spirit to God, a God, one of three in a trinity. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, which is the power of the highest. Now, stop and think about this. If the Holy Spirit were God, or a God, one of three gods, then this would make the Holy Spirit the Father of Jesus and not God the Father. Let's continue on. And the power of the highest shall overshadow you. For this reason, the holy thing being begotten in you shall be called the Son of God. Now, that's a, a, the correct translation because being begotten means that right as the angel was talking to her, the power of, of the highest was coming upon her, and that pinprick of life that was the word that was God who was reduced to this human pinprick of life was being impregnated in her right as the angel was talking. Let's read that again. The Holy One being begotten in you shall be called the Son of God. And that's how Jesus became the Son who was the Lord God of the Old Testament, the rock of the Old Testament, who became Jesus Christ, the Lord God of the New Testament, the only begotten of God the Father in this particular way. Did not happen to any other. The only begotten. Now, let's come to the first chapter of John again. Let's see something else that we need to understand because there's another false doctrine out there, which is in the Roman Catholic Church, which says, and it took them uh, how many centuries to determine this? Well, about 18 centuries, that she was immaculately conceived just as Jesus was. Now, let me tell you something. I defy you to find that in the Bible. That is not there. And we're going to see a little later that Mary is not in heaven, and she was not assumed bodily into heaven as the Roman Catholic Church claims. Nowhere do you find that in the Bible. Now let's pick it up in verse 14. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we ourselves, that is the apostles, beheld his glory, the glory, as of the only begotten with the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten in that way. Now, Christians, in receiving the Spirit of God, are begotten in the spirit of their minds, but that is entirely different than how Jesus was conceived. The only begotten. Mary was not also begotten with an immaculate conception. Not true. Nowhere do you find it. Listen, you cannot create doctrine out of whole cloth. You cannot take something that men and philosophers dream up in order to give goddess ship to Mary, and that she is a mediatrix in heaven right now to intercede for us because she can talk better than Jesus. Now, what an utter blasphemous lie that that is. Christ is our mediator. He is our intercessor. He is our redeemer and not the Virgin Mary. And furthermore, the Catholics believe that also in the Eucharist, since she was the mother of Jesus, is also the blood of Mary. Not true. You see how far astray men have gone? You see how these things have come about? By traditions of men through the lying and deception of Satan the devil, the twisting and turning of Scripture? Jesus Christ is the only begotten, Let's come down here to verse 17. 
let's learn another lesson, you see. See, if you read and study the Bible, you can learn a lot of things you never knew. Because most churches don't teach you to study the Bible. And of those adults who read the Bible, it's only 40% of churchgoers. So 60% of churchgoers never read the Bible. Oh, they go to church and they're told how good that God is and how good they need to feel and that God is going to do everything for them, but they know nothing about God. They know nothing about Jesus Christ. They know nothing about the truth of God. They don't know the scriptures. They don't study them. They don't prove things. So how can they call themselves Christians? you ever wonder that? All right, let's read it here. For the law was given through Moses, but the grace and the truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now let's talk about this verse number 18 here, because this becomes very important for us to understand. No one has seen God at any time. That means also confirms the fact that the Lord God of the Old Testament, the one whom Adam and Eve saw, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saw and talked to, that Moses talked to, that Moses saw the glory of the back part of God, was the one who became Jesus Christ. This again verifies it. Now, let's come to John, the third chapter. Let's read something here in verse 13. Now remember, it says, no one has seen God at any time. All right? Here's where it tells us that Mary has not ascended into heaven. Now, how do we know this? Because this is a parenthetical statement that John put in there as a clarification, and John wrote this well after the death of the Virgin Mary. Okay? Okay? And by the way, she had other children, too. She was not a perpetual, immaculate virgin. She had three other sons, and we don't know how many daughters. Now, you find that in Mark, the sixth chapter. Now, John 3 and verse 13, And no one has ascended into heaven except he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. At the time that John gave this clarifying verse in verse 13, he was in heaven, and no one else has ascended to heaven. And by the way, this means that no one has gone to heaven. So if you go to a church which says, oh, when you die, you go to heaven, that's not in the Bible. Ask yourself the question, if when you die you go to heaven, what is the value of the resurrection? And how does that take place? Well, you can't figure it out because it's not true. When you die, you die. And God has to resurrect you, and he's the one who keeps track of your spirit so that he can grant you a spiritual body at the resurrection. There it is right there. Now, we'll cover that in other things as we go along. Now, let's ask the question, how was Jesus taught? Did God leave it to rabbis, and did he just, just attend a, a synagogue school, and that is how he was taught? How was Jesus taught? Well, there's a prophecy of it here in Isaiah 50, because we find in John the seventh chapter that they didn't believe that he was the Messiah because all of the rabbis checked out and found out, did he go to any of the rabbinic schools? No, they said he was unlearned. So how was Jesus taught? Jesus said he was taught of his father. Now, here's a prophecy of it in Isaiah, the 50th chapter. Verse 4, 
The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned to know how to help the weary with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as one being taught. He was taught early in the morning by God the Father directly. Not by any man. Verse 5, the Lord has opened my ear. I was not rebellious nor turned away backwards. Now we know this is talking of Jesus because verse 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Jesus was taught of the Father. So there you have it. That's how Jesus was born into the world the only begotten Son of God via that kind of begettal. That's why he is the only Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, he alone is our creator. In doing this and then laying down his life can be the one who can save us from our sin. Stunning revelations, aren't they? Yes, well, this knowledge is there if you will study it, if you will prove it in your Bible. So be sure and visit our other website, cbcg.org. Download the sermons, download even the video sermons that we have there. So until next time, this is Fred Coulter saying so long, everyone, and thank you for inviting me into your home. <laughs>